Hello everyone, my name is Loco and welcome back to another professional best of three series in StarCraft 2. And what I got for you today is a super high level match of Terran versus Zerg. It actually feels like it's been a little bit of time since I last did a best of three series here on YouTube. Uh, the reason for that is simply put, there haven't been a lot of uh, a lot of events recently that have released replay packs. There's been there's been plenty of big events. Obviously, the WESG did end up releasing their replay pack, but I was there to cast the event offline. So you know, obviously, uh, I hopefully I obviously saw a lot of those games already. Regardless, though, this game right here, this best of three series, is part of the BTSL. It's one of the events uh, that Base Trade occasionally does put out. I think they've been doing them actually for a couple of years. Years now, the offline finals of this tournament even will be taking place over in Vancouver in May, in really just a couple of weeks from now. I'm excited to see who ends up becoming the victor of this one, but before I ramble on about unrelated stuff, let's go ahead and introduce the players. Spawning here in the bottom right hand corner of Catalyst in game number one of this series, and playing with the red, or rather not the red, this is blue loco, it's the blue Terran SCVs, he goes by the name of Gumiho. And his opponent, spawning all the way in the top left-hand corner of the map. He's also actually playing with the bluish colors. I guess this would be considered teal or cyan or something along those lines. But we are looking at the main base of Solar. Now, Solar and Gumiho definitely both well-respected professional gamers. They have both been around for years. They are both considered to be some of the very best that StarCraft 2 has to offer. So I'm excited to see what kind of strategies they have in mind. So far though, nothing really out of the ordinary just yet. We see Gumiho going for that uh, quick refinery inside of his main base. He's now going for a barracks as one. It looks like a factory will be added on very quickly. There we go. After starting up that command center on the low ground as well. In the meantime, though, on the other side of the map, Solar is already getting himself that quick expansion on the low ground as well. He went for that hatchery first. Now that he has uh, 100 gas here, he's going to be starting up the metabolic boost upgrade, even though there is some confetti near his hatchery. He's now also started up a set of queens. Now, this was indeed played just a few days ago. Um, as you may be aware, there's currently some confetti and some celebrations in StarCraft 2 because of the 20 year anniversary. StarCraft 1 actually came out uh, 20 years ago, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, right? There's not a whole lot of franchises out there when it comes to playing video games that have been running for 20 years and are still, uh, that are still actively at the top of their game. One of the new school uh, additions actually to the Terran vs Zerg matchup is that Zergs are spending their very first uh, energy on Queens on one of those creep tumors. It's pretty interesting. A lot of Terran players have been opting to leave this Reaper at their home base for a little while longer just because of the popularity of pool first builds. Uh, Terran players have decided that they usually want to keep that Reaper close to their natural expansion while the command center is still building just in case a couple of Zerglings manage to move across the map. So far though, nice little bit of micro here uh, by Gumiho, trying to see if he can deal a bunch of damage with this very first Reaper anyway. It does say caution right here, right? A little arrow pointing down immediately as to where that Reaper is indeed gonna leave the main base. 1-1-1 one, one, one opening here for Gumiho. We have been seeing a bunch of Terran players opening up 16 Marine drops once again. There's also been some double factory play, but there's no denying that one barracks, one factory, and then one starport is the gold standard. And Solar will actually figure out here in just a little bit uh, what exactly it is that he is going up against. Indeed, the 1-1-1 one, one, one style will be spotted. There is that tech lab right now on uh, the starport as well. Already though, we see that Liberator queued up here for Gumiho, so no Banshee play here just yet. I'm curious to see how Solar is going to respond to the Hellions. Um, he hasn't decided to go for a Roach Warren or Evo Chambers just yet. All right, okay, there, well, there you go. Speaking of Devil, uh, immediately he does decide to go for that Roach Warren, which is pretty critical when it comes to defending, for example, um, against a whole bunch of those Hellions. Now, we even see that Armory coming up very early here for Gumiho. Uh, this is completely unscouted so far by the Zerg player, although a single Ling is now trying to make their way inside of the main base here of the Terran player, although the Supply Depot there has 
indeed been raised. So that does mean that this Hellbat push is unscouted for the time being. A couple of links, though, once again, are trying to make their way across the map. Reaper decided to get back into the main as well. It will now be sacrificed in favor of apparently denying a little bit of mining time as well. Solar is now going to be dealing with a lot of these Hellbats, though, and he doesn't really have any roaches out just yet. He's currently in the process of harassing on the other side of the map, but so far, these units are really going to go to town. And so far, I mean, even though the drones will likely not go down, this does buy a lot of time here for our Terran player, because I think the Liberator, indeed, is making its way towards that main base. Very nicely played so far here uh, by Solar, though, not really losing anything critical, although three drones there do end up going down. But this is really the big pain, right? Look at this. This is like, what, like 18, 20 drones or so that are simply hanging out on the left-hand side of the main? That's a lot of lost mining time. What you gotta keep in mind is that one drone mines for about one mineral a second. This is at least a good 30, uh, 30 seconds where these drones aren't harvesting resources. That's a couple hundred minerals lost easily. Plus on top of that, of course, the three drones as well. Now Solar did end up killing all of the Hellbats. That's one thing that we do have to keep in mind. And while this is looking like it's maybe a slight favor here for our Zerg player, we are definitely setting ourselves up for a nice little macro game. Apparently, Gumiho is gonna follow this up right now with more and more factories. He was actually the one that popularized that Thor drop style a couple of years ago. It's one of the reasons why he ended up winning a GSL Code S. It does look like actually he's gonna do exactly that. Starport now has got that reactor, so he's gonna be able to go for Metavex. Double Thors are likely gonna be coming up here as well. And you can do some crazy micro if you are good enough. Do it. There we go. Double Thor immediately coming up here for our Terran player. And I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to be seeing double Metavex coming out of this starport in just a little bit. And the thing is, right, in the earlier stages of the game, Solar is not really going to have a whole lot of flying units. Now, speaking of which, he is going to go up to that Spire right now. But usually, uh, these uh, these Metavex are going to have a field day just simply microing the Thors back and forth. And they can actually really get rid of a lot of those important tech structures. Of course, though, Solar knows what it is uh, that he's going up against right now, or who it is that he's going up against right now. He's going to send a couple of roaches across the map. And seeing the lack of, uh, for example, uh, for example, Siege Tank, I think he, uh, he should be aware right now of roughly what it is he could be going up against as well. The single Benshi now on the other side of the map will go up in some beautiful confetti as well. But Gumiho, I mean, he manages to deflect his for the time being. Does he know about the continued harassment? It does look like a few Ravagers will be morphed in as well. I wonder if he is really going to push forward here. There's more than enough defenses right now available. One Thor will not be lifted up just yet, although it's likely going to be picked up by the Medivac in just a second. However, I gotta say, I really like this. The Spire timing, that was pretty much perfect. Solar knows that his opponent loves to go for that Thor drop shenanigans. If you get a couple of Mutas out, right, not only can you harass those mineral lines very nicely, but you can also uh, make it rather difficult for your opponent to actually deal any kind of damage with, for example, those Thor drops. Fort base is going to be up and running here in just a second for our Zerg player in Teal. That's not something I've said very many times before. We see now that that, uh, that infestation pit here coming up as well for the Zerg, so he's likely going to be transitioning to watch a rather quick hive. Hellions now, though, once again, are starting to make their move across the map. There are two, meta or two Metavex here inside of the middle of the map here as well. This does mean, apparently, the Mutas are not going to go after them. They're instead headed towards the main base here of the Terran player. A couple of the Hellions now made their way towards the top right-hand corner. At the same time, Zerklings are trying to set up for a bit of a run by there. Mutas have now arrived in the main base, and Missile Turret will greet them almost immediately. And you can see the skill level, right? Players are microing at like four different angles at once. However, while Missile Turret did go up inside of that main base, there is none to be seen just yet inside of the natural. The Thors are still going to town here as well. One of them is running awfully low, and it will indeed go up in a puff of confetti as well, because I think that Solo was busy microing at those Mutas in the main. An eye for an eye, really, right? Like, both players are taking pretty critical losses here. I do think that Solar is the one that comes out ahead. Look at the crazy amount of creep tumors here, actually. That's kind of silly. That's, that's more tumors than you really need uh, at this area of the map, in particular, if you're not going to be spreading them. 
There we go. The queens are just simply being rapid fire to try and uh, put down as many of those tumors as possible. Anyway, so far, right, both players really taking a bunch of losses here and there, but it's hard to say who is currently ahead. And this is the kind of game that I love watching. Fourth command center just about to finish up here for Gumiho. He's going to send a few SCVs here for the hug of love on that Thor. Make sure that it is going to be back at full HP here in just a little bit. And while Roaches and Ravagers are still roaming the map, soon they are not the units really that you need if you are a Zerg player at this point in the game. I mean, there are going to be so many Siege Tanks and Thors and whatnot out that they are going to be easily taken care of. Look at that, three Siege Tanks now coming out at one given moment. Now, Solar is now transitioning towards a couple of those Vipers. We're not seeing a Greater Spire or anything along those lines yet. I say that and he immediately does morph it in. His creep spread is looking pretty menacing as well. And what he has done successfully is that he has prevented his Terran from really continuously setting up another timing push. There's only a single armory here still for Gumiho, so he's only getting one upgrade at a time. And usually that's like a, a momentum-focused kind of Terran style. Usually uh, double, uh, double armory is quite a bit more common if you're going to be this laid back. But this is kind of what Solar has forced right now, right? He can't, really, he can't really have the Terran player roaming the map with a big mech army. And if the army doesn't really exist, it obviously is very difficult to push with it as well. I think that we are just waiting for the Vipers to accumulate that energy right now. There we go. They are likely going to be going for a bit of a push here in just a little bit. Gumiho must feel that he's, uh, he's up with his back against the wall right now as well. He does have a very solid position here in the middle of the map though. This is not something you can push into if you are the Zerg, but there is definitely this, this potential for a counterattack into the natural here as well. Now, the Hellions and the actually that single Cyclone providing a lot of value here as well. Beautiful pickup here actually uh, by Gumiho, getting a big chunk of that Zerg army for practically free. And now, once again, he decides to load up those Medivacs uh, with the Thors and he will be able to get that army away from it. I actually am curious why he hasn't collapsed the Rock Tower yet, right? You can get so much more value there. I guess the positioning right here of these sensor towers just sort of allows him to control this terrain just fine anyway. And apparently Gumiho, feeling very confident, he has decided that he wants to go for a fifth command center. And he puts it out right here in the middle of the map. Now there's really no way, oh my god, that's actually pretty painful. Oh, two Thors! Uh, with two Metavex do end up going down there. Very nicely done. Now at the same time, the Hellions made their way towards this side of the map. There is no blue flame on these just yet, but they are still going to be able to roast a lot of those workers. Now for some reason, they're actually headed to the natural in the main base. There's not really a whole lot of workers here in general. I guess they are easily accessible. That does mean that right now he knows about the fact that the Great Aspire units are going to be coming up here in just a little bit. Roach is now even moving towards the third base here of the Terran player as well. But I think that where are the Brute Lords? There we go. The Brutes are already morphing in and Solar has got a very menacing army. Still, three Thors are coming out right now at any given moment. The same can be said here for those Viking as well. There are going to be a lot of very scary attacking units and Gumiho right now, right, he's setting himself up for that late game. He's already got a bunch of additional uh, command centers just about to finish up. That means shortly he's going to be able to get rid of most of his Terran SCVs as well, because he can just simply land mules if he likes to. Gumiho is now also getting very close to maxing out, and while I do like Solar's positioning here, right, he does have to be a little bit careful. He still has a lot of mining here himself, though, but I think he's had enough. It does look like he wants to go for a move. Now, there are a lot of Vikings here available. How many, uh, how many um, Hydras do we see at this point? There are 27 of them, definitely more than enough. Still, though, nice little bit of abducting, getting rid of pretty much most of those Vikings here for the time being. That does all of a sudden give those Brute Lords free reign, forces the Unsiege on the majority majority of those siege tanks as well and all of a sudden the hydras are trying to move forward all of the vipers though except of one did get picked off there um, the roaches are now also going to town there in the bottom left hand corner of the map and i think that solar he's trying to see if he can potentially force the game right now i think that solar is smelling blood he wants to finish up this game right here right now and while he is doing a solid job dealing with all of these outer expansions the fight in the middle is looking decent as well but there are still so many terran units remaining 
Vikings, though, they are the... You know, those are the ones that got picked off, right? And while there are a lot of Thors, they aren't super reliable when we're talking about big numbers of Brute Lords. And I think that Solar, playing a magnificent game, may have very well done it. I mean, there are still a couple of Siege Tanks remaining. I was a little hesitant when I first saw him move through the center of this map, because this was a very well fortified position. I really feel like it's these little run-bys with the roaches continuously that provide him so much value. But in game number one, Solar obtains the victory. Alrighty, so that does mean that right now we are going to be heading into game number two, which is taking place on a black pink le another one of these really really standard macro focused maps not a lot of deviation when it comes to build orders on this particular one although i have seen a lot of terran players and with a lot of terran players i mostly just uh, i mostly just mean maru i suppose absolutely smash their zerk opponents the thing is if you quickly look over to the to the zerk side of things right here's the main base here's the natural usually this is going to be the third base however zerk runs into an issue when it comes to taking a fourth they can take the fourth down here however this base is very easy to push into with for example siege tanks on the high ground and then marines dashing forwards and backwards until the base falls or zerk can take the fourth base up here but the same can be said over in this area there's a lot of great siegeable locations and i wonder if we're going to be seeing something along those lines as well from gumiho it's kind of interesting though this was a map that was pretty heavily in favor of the zerk when it first came out but now all of a sudden right Right? We have seen Terran players uh, really showing us how to properly deal with a fort base of the Zerg. So I'm curious to see if Gumiho is going to be able to pull something like that off here in this particular match. He is definitely a player that likes to play the mech-based style, so obviously you can still do like a, a siege tank-based push, but usually it's going to hit quite a bit later than you would usually expect a, a marine tank hit uh, to arrive. But Gumiho perfectly capable of playing that bio-based army as well, and while he may not necessarily be known for it, I mean, Terran players, if there's one thing you can say about uh, the top of the line, Terran players in StarCraft 2, right, is, is variety. They are very good at a variety of build orders, and while maybe... If you're like a Grandmaster level player in Europe or in North America or in Asia or whatever, you can get away with like playing one kind of play style and one kind of strategy in all three matchups. But at this level of play, you really do have to mix it up. Likewise, I'm curious to see uh, what Solar has got in store for us in this particular one. He shows that he's very good at playing that Roach Hydra based composition. I personally always struggle a little bit with it, because I have a tendency to stick around on roaches for too long. I'd never really quite know what kind of upgrades I want to go for, just because the timing of the hive and whatnot is very important as well. There's all kinds of little mistakes that you can make if you are a Zerg player, but Solar giving us a bit of a masterclass when it comes to playing the mid-game in game number one. This time around, apparently, the Reaper is feeling a little bit more brave rather than going for that spawning pool first, though. Solar did already showcase that he likes to go for that hatchery first, and why change a winning strategy, right? Why change when you already are in a very nice lead? Starport now coming up once again here for Gumiho transitioning to watch that 1-1-1 style nothing all too crazy just yet here on the Terran side of things and Solar did manage to sneak out a single drone to construct that very quick third hatchery here as well. There's a very quick second refinery here. I'm curious to see if that means that we are going to be seeing something a little bit different. Maybe we could be seeing a cloaking field upgrade. He is going to immediately do uh, the big switcheroo once again, though. Curious to see if there's going to be another tech lab follow-up here for Gumiho so he can start up his stim pack. It does look like we are indeed immediately going to be seeing the Banshee this time around. So a little bit... Uh, oh no, he actually does switch it around right there for a Viking. I'm pretty sure that was a Banshee just now, right? I think it may very well just be a response to seeing this very first Overlord. He's decided that he kind of wants to hide his tech here. And, you know, killing an Overlord or two is actually really critical at this point. Because this really does slow down the Zerg's economy quite a bit. Solar this time around, not quite going for like a 4 minute Roach Warren that he did in the previous game. Instead, he's now going for a 345 one. Doesn't seem like it's a big difference, but I wonder if this is maybe a response. And actually, this is cute, right? We see that cloaking field upgrade right now. Uh, but this might very well be a response to the Hellbat push in game number 1. Will the cloak finish? Will he decide to let it up? Okay, it does look like, nope. <laughs> I love this. It's just one of those small things that you see at this level of play, right? So let me try and explain that. 
He knows that the Overlord is scouting around, it saw the green light inside of the attack lab, so he knows that something is researching. More often than not, that is going to be a cloaking field for Banshees. Now, Gumiho is still going to make a Banshee, however, he knows that he's already forced the damage by just simply uh, showing that green light. This does force a very quick lair and probably a Spore Crawler or two here in just a little bit uh, from our Zerg player, in particular after what happened in game number one, right, with that Liberator and all that. Wouldn't be surprised if a Spore goes down in just a little bit, but since he knows that the damage has already been dealt, he doesn't need the Cloaking Field upgrade, so he rather saves those resources, and he decides to just simply cancel it. It's a cute little move, and there indeed we do now see those spores coming up at the correct timing, if indeed a push with those Banshees would be coming up. Once again, though, a mech base switch here for Gumiho. He's now transitioning, uh, and by the way, the Viking has now arrived on the other side of the map. A couple of the Hellions are still roaming as well, but he is now transitioning towards that double armory style. So something a little bit differently. Roaches will be able to uh, deflect this, uh, this first group of Hellions a little bit easier. Solar playing it just a bit safer, and while the supply count can be a little bit deceiving right now, this might indicate a massive advantage here for the Zerg. And he is getting himself a lot of workers, but there's no denying that he also built seven uh, Roaches here to just simply try and be safe against whatever it is that Gumiho has got in store. So usually you can sort of judge what kind of style Terran wants to go for, in particular Korean Terran players, um, from seeing the amount of armories they make when they are playing mech. One armory usually indicates that they're going to be playing like more a timing attack focused Terran style, whereas two factories, or two armories rather, usually is going to be that more laid back kind of Terran style, where you really get yourself a lot of upgrades and then you push across the map once you max out. Oh well. Okay, okay, well, I don't really know exactly what that announcer just said, but there is no denying that right now Solar knows very little about what is going on. He does go immediately up to a, like a 6 minute and 20 second hive. I want to just emphasize how like early that was. Now, apparently, oh my god, did you see that? The, the changeling got killed there by a single one of those SCVs. I didn't really see very much. At this point, he doesn't really know very much of anything. I'm assuming that he knows that he is going up against, uh, for example, a mech-based style. I mean, he's going up against Gumiho, so it's a safe bet, I suppose. Actually, a bit of a supply block here. Whoa. Okay, no, actually, now the Supply Depot just finished up, or he may have landed one of those things. But regardless, um, there's no denying that Solar went for a super quick hive. I mean, he's playing extremely greedy in this game. He may have read something that I did not quite see just yet. I guess maybe just seeing the timing on that third base is enough for him to decide that he wants to go for a really que uh, a really greedy fourth base and then also a Hive as well. This will give him access to a variety of tech, but look at this. Hive is done before 1-1 one -one is even halfway finished, right? That is extremely quick. Hellions now once again trying to deal a little bit of damage. The Thor drop has now arrived inside of that main base here of the Zerg player. Great bit of micro so far. We now see the Queens trying to go for the surround here as well. But these Thors, they are on high impact mode. They are dealing a whole bunch of damage here as well. Vipers immediately being produced here. And I really think it's mostly the Vipers that uh, that Solar is looking for. I guess the cost of a, of a Hive is negligible, or negligible right now at this point in the game. So maybe he uh, he knows that the Viper value is just simply going to be more important than anything else. Yeah, he's just simply... I thought he was maybe setting himself up for like a timing push or something with like Great Aspire units or Ultralisk or something along those lines. But no, he just went for a really quick Hive, got himself a handful of Vipers out that are already going to be generating some of that energy, consuming some of that Hatchery's HP. And I guess he's going to be able to um, defend if he needs to, but he can also get a little bit more aggressive by just simply using those units accordingly, and then eventually, he does start up a Spire here as well. Gumiho, like we expected, right, he's now sitting back a lot more. He's got that double armory style, he knows he's gonna have a really powerful maxed out army, he's gonna now even go for the smart servos upgrade that allows his Thors and his Hellions and whatnot, as well as the Vikings to transition to watch their different forms a little bit easier as well. There's now that other base here coming up for Gumiho, much more passive. I mean, he did go for the Viking, or rather for the for the drops there with the um, with the Thors, but much more passive here for our Terran player so far. Not really, uh, not really all too bothered about what the Zerg player is doing, and definitely not all too bothered by the creep spread just yet, which, by the way, is pretty much everywhere. Look at this. 
really solid work there on uh, on Solar's end of the spectrum. Now, once again, Solar is going to be stuck on this Roach Hydra base composition, right? He's likely going to be transitioning towards a Greater Spire here in a little bit. He's now finally started up the 2-2 upgrades. But a Zerg player who's behind in upgrades against a Mech player? That's not quite where you want to be. He does have a very solid amount of tech, of course, but the Vipers so far have not really provided any kind of value. Now, Solar is looking for an angle here. There are a lot of nice units. Beautiful Abduct there, getting rid of one of those Thors. But there are still a lot of Siege Tanks remaining, and look at that. The majority of them aren't even really sieged up. I feel like uh, this is mostly just a trap, right, that Gumiho has set right now, and is just waiting for the perfect opportunity where the Zerg player overextends and then he's just simply gonna spring uh, right on top of his opponent's army. 3-3 three, three is now started up before 2-2 two, two is done on the other side of the map. I'm honestly getting a little bit worried here for Gumiho, or rather for Solar. Gumiho has got a solid amount of economy. He's not really been uh, he's not really been in any kind of trouble here whatsoever. He's got a very confident amount of army here as well. Now he is he is sieging up his tanks in a very scary position, right? That is one. Um, I I guess. Oh my god, that's a crazy a crazy uh, uh, blinding cloud that you can put right on top of all of those tanks. Although I guess the Vikings are trying to bait this. I I wonder if this is on purpose. What do you think? Do you think Gumiho is doing these siege tank sieges like this on purpose to try and bait the Vipers to overextend? That will be next level decision making there actually by our Terran player. But right now, the Terran player is maxed out. He's got mech units that are extremely strong. He's going to be able to hit right before Brute Lords are out. And here we go, right? He's starting his slow push. Now, uh, this is definitely an army that needs its time, right? You can't really fight on creep all too aggressively, so indeed these tumors will be dealt with as well. At the same time, though, immediately once the Terran player tries to move across, we see a, a, a Roach Hydra-based army now also moving over towards that third base location here of our Terran player. Still, nice little move here as well by Solar at the exact same time, lending those blinding clouds brilliantly. And while the command center lives here for the time being, that is 18 SCVs. And Solar, I mean, he ended up losing units that he didn't really want anyway, right? He's now trading up that supply that he just lost in Roaches and a couple of Hydras to watch Brute Lords instead. Beautiful move there actually by Solar. I was starting to get a little bit worried for him here, but right now he is looking like he is once again in control of this game. Still, though, this can be over in a heartbeat. Now, we even see Gumiho transitioning to watch a bunch of Cyclones. Very interesting. But he will be finishing up, and that is Gumiho, with 3-3 upgrades in just a little bit, right? This is still a very menacing Terran army. He's gonna have 3-3 way before his opponent, because 3-3 isn't even started on the other side of the map just yet. There are also no upgrades on the air units here for our Zerg player. So, while this is a very scary Zerg army, mostly just because of the kind of units, I really feel like the upgrade count is gonna go heavily, heavily in favor of Gumiho right here. And I think the game will likely be decided with the big push that's gonna be moving across the map here in just a little bit. Only 55 SCVs. There's no additional command center, um, you know, that's landed at another base just yet. He does have a lot of, uh, he does have a lot of scans now available because of, of course, those orbital commands that he produced just a little bit ago. But I really feel like 55 workers is not really enough to carry you to watch the later stages of the game. Still, both players are right now maxed out. And the army supply, I mean, that's 143 army supply versus only like 120. Not quite where you want to be, but so far, Gumiao is really trying to do all kinds of tricksy move here. Try to split up his Terran mech army, getting rid of some of that uh, some of that creep spread as well. Nicely done, though, and this apparently now also opens up the opportunity for the rest of the Terran mech army to start moving deep onto the creep. Siege tanks are not sieged up just yet, but apparently that is indeed the meant decision. At the same time, though, oh my god, a lot of these Vikings are taking huge amounts of damage. We now see that, uh, that Terran army moving very deep onto the creep, but there's no more Brute Lords available. The Brute Lords were all dealt with, with the exception of one. This one will now also get shut down by that single Thor. And while we see a couple of the Brutes being morphed in here, Solar, he is caught with his pants down. Yeah, he is gonna be forced to GG out as Gumio's army is just a little bit too big. It's almost as if Gumiho was welcoming, right? The killing of his, uh, of his SCVs there. He ended up losing, I believe, 18. He immediately replaced all of those SCVs with more attacking units. 
And that meant that he just simply had a massive army that he could move across the map with. And Solar, he didn't quite have that static defense yet. He didn't quite have the massive amount of Brute Lords just yet. He was forced to split up his army and Gumiho with a brilliant attack. He decides that apparently that's enough and Solar loses game two. All right, well, there we go. This brings us to the third and final map of this best of three series. Spawning here in the bottom right hand corner of Acid Plant and playing with the blue Terran SCVs, we're looking at the main base of Gumiho. And his opponent, playing with the Teal Zerg drones, we have Solar. Very nice game there. Definitely a lot more passive though than game number one. I would like this game to go the distance, right? I always am a big fan of players who decide to, uh, you know, maybe mix it up. I wouldn't be surprised if we're gonna see a little bit of cheese here as well, though neither Solar or Gumiho are really well known for their cheesy play. I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit more of like an aggressive kind of style, in particular because Solar is not really scouting heavily here for, for example, proxy barracks either. A very common location for barracks is right over here or sometimes right over here or so. Uh, Solar would not find out about those marines or for example, uh, even, uh, even for example, reapers, right? He wouldn't find out about those until they are already on his side of the map. Now granted, Gumiho, I mean, he's got a history in games as well where he really doesn't go for a whole lot of cheese. I don't actually recall the last time that I saw him actively cheese. I mean, he, he definitely did do it uh, back in like his GSL heydays as well. But he uh, he's definitely still one of those players who prefers playing the macro game. Quick refinery here. Once again, that barracks coming up very early on. We see that hatchery going down as the very first structure here of our Zerg player. And he's now also going to be saturating this extractor. I met Solar actually at a, at a whole bunch of events. The same actually can be said for Gumiho as well, but usually when you go to these gaming events, a lot of the pro gamers stay together, in particular, uh, in particular of course, the Korean guys. Not necessarily because they don't like, you know, the non-Koreans the non or they don't like those professional gamers. They meet them at events all the time, but there's a bit of a language barrier, right? I mean, obviously, Korean is very different from uh, from English, and while a lot of the Korean pros do speak some English, there's like this uh, this confidence that you kind of need as well when you first start speaking English, where you feel like you're gonna make a lot of mistakes, and I wonder if that's part of it, but regardless, at the very least, that's what I experienced when I first started talking a lot of English myself. But anyways, uh, Solar, he definitely does not have that issue. Solar speaks fluent English, he's one of those people that definitely does come over to a lot of the... Uh, to a lot of the uh, non-Korean players and, uh, and for example, casters like myself as well, and uh, it's always a lot of fun. I remember, uh, I think it was BlizzCon a couple of years ago, <clears throat> he, um, he mentioned that he, uh, he saw one of my build order videos <laughs> of a video or of a, of a replay that I casted from Solar. So I made a video years ago of, uh, of one of the games that Solar played, and I made like a build order tutorial on how Solar played, and he said, Loco, the video was fun, but you got it all wrong. I, I did not play like that at all. I just simply, uh, you know, scouted what my opponent was doing and then I responded accordingly. So it worked very specifically against the opponent of that game, but I wouldn't recommend playing that on the ladder. I'm like, all right, fine, fine, Solar. It's actually kind of funny. A lot of these Korean guys uh, and a lot of the professional gamers in SC2, they don't follow super strict build orders anymore. It's a little bit different than what we used to see back in the day in StarCraft 2. They don't necessarily follow super strict builds anymore, but it's much more feeling based, right? Essentially, you don't make the starport at like, I don't know, uh, 32 supply. You make it right when you have the resources to make the starport as soon as possible, while not cutting out too many workers. That's kind of the way we're talking right now. There's no real like, oh, at 3 minutes and 30 seconds, I'm gonna put down a roach war. No, you put it down when you have the resources for it and when you scout out what your opponent is going for. Now, speaking of which, I'm curious to see if Solar is going to plant it down right now. He once again scouts that 1-1-1 kind of style here from his opponent, so he knows what it is he's going up against. In game one, he made it at, f at right around four minutes. In game two, oh wow, a little bit of missed micro there. There we go. At game two, he made it at 3.45. Right now, apparently, he's once again going back to the four-minute mark. Not sure as to why that is. I guess in uh, in game one, he may have actually queued up these links first and then the Roach Warren too. It's a little bit of deviation here from time to time, but... It's all good. Most of these things are going to be feeling based at this point in time in SC2, which I personally really like, right? It's really cool to see, you know, the subtle differences and adjustments that you make. Because obviously, if you play super timing focused, everything is going to become super predictable as well. Benchy once again here coming up for Gumiho. This time around, he does have that cloaking field coming up as well. 
Immediately now, a couple of the Hellions decided to move across the map. Three drones will go down. The Lynx were occupied inside of that main base, but it looks like they will stay there for a little while longer. Three drones, definitely not the biggest of losses, but there is also this thing that you need to keep in mind here for the Terran player. Gumiho lost absolutely nothing. He's now apparently even feeling confident enough to put the command center at the third base location as well. Apparently though, the two medevac or the two cyclones right here in the medevac will be deflected here for the time being. First Banshee now moving across the map. The cloaking field upgrade will be finishing up in just a little bit. The second Banshee now also coming up here for our Terran player. Armory now going down near the front. I'm always curious as to why players position units where they do. So far though, nice little bit of micro. He does need to be careful. This uh, medevac is running awfully low. It may actually end up going down and that does mean that these Cyclones are on a bit of a timer. They will try their very best to stay alive for a little while longer, but here we go, at the exact same time, a couple of the Hellions made their way into that natural mineral line. Incredible maneuvering here by Gumiho, really trying to seesaw in between the different bases and try to hit at several different angles at once. And while sure, he's gonna end up losing the majority of those Hellions that ran by, and sure, he ended up losing the Cyclones inside of that main base. There is no denying, right? 19 drones in exchange for about a thousand mineral of 450 gas that is most definitely a trade that gumiho will make any day of the week and right now all of a sudden right that banshee nuisance has also arrived on this site we see that single spore crawler coming up right now as well the hellions apparently not done just yet though they're once again gonna go after uh the drones here in this third base location and while it's once again nothing critical it's 22 drones added up together Right? And that's magnificent. While this was all going on, Gumio finished up that third command center on his side of the map. And he is really going to be able to, uh, you know, take a small advantage. And this is where that Terran momentum comes into play. A lot of these top of the line Korean guys in particular, they play a very momentum based playstyle. They take a small advantage in the early game. And in this game, we can definitely say it's a big advantage. But they take an advantage in the early game and then they run away with the victory. I have to say, I really do like the one armory style against this, right? Once again, that indicates to us that he's gonna be going for a more aggressive focus style. And apparently right now, Solar is kind of feeling the heat as well. He knows he's gonna be behind economically. He needs to get units out to deflect any kind of aggression here from the Terran player. So he decides to go for the Swarm Host. He's now also sticking around on Roaches with plus one upgrades here instead. But once again, the Hellions are coming into that mineral line. Three drones end up falling almost immediately and while Sure, a couple of the uh, couple of the Hellions end up dying once again. These mineral units are exploitable, right? He doesn't really need those necessarily. That's 12 additional workers, and that's just because of that small advantage that Gumiho had earlier. Solar is forced to make a response, right? He's trying desperately to squeeze out workers. Right now, he's going for a bunch of these swarm hosts to try and defend against all of this aggression, but Gumiho is all over it. More drones are coming up right now as well for Solar, but remember, right? In game two, we saw like a six minute and 30 second hive. We saw a fourth base coming up at that exact moment as well. Right now, we are eight minutes into it and we haven't seen either of those. What we have seen is a lot of roasted drones. And while I, for one, would like to go to a drone barbecue because I think that it would be absolutely delicious, there is no denying that Gumiho is in firm control of this game right here, right now. Oh, man. Look at that. Just being a bit of a nuisance here with these leftover banshees as well. Apparently now even a couple of those uh, couple of those locusts will just simply be flying across the map here as well. And they really didn't get anything done whatsoever. Gumiho, I mean, he has now started up a second armory here too. Actually, you may have had that one earlier. Maybe I didn't see it just yet at, uh, at the point where I looked back at the Terran's natural. But regardless, I would really like to see a bit of a push here once again from Gumiho. He has got a continuous Thor drops. I love it. Honestly, the Thor drops are so good. A lot of Terran players have opted to not go for those anymore in recent times. Gumiho, one of those guys that really does still like it. I have to agree with him. It's really powerful. You can deal so much damage. But here we go, right? I mean, now even the queens are being pushed across the map. This is a slow-moving army. And Solar, he is definitely in a situation where he has to try his very best and deal critical amounts of damage. Now, speaking of critical amounts of damage, right? Gumiho, he's now target firing down the main base. And while apparently a couple of the producing structures here inside of the main of the Terran player will be in trouble as well. Great lift off there by Gumiho. The Thors are going to town and ever since they got their plus one armor buff, 
That does mean that one Thor has to pay for this with their life as well, but the base falls. There's no more hatchery or lair even at this point in the game for the Zerg player. Solar is starting to fall apart. A little bit of sloppy move there, though, once again by Gumiho, right? He ended up losing a whole lot of those units. Not perfect micro uh, by him by any stretch of the imagination, but he is just so far ahead. 37 workers that I don't think it even really matters anymore. Plus two is just about to finish up here for Gumio as well. There's no fourth base just yet here for our Terran player either. There are a lot of Hellbats though. They don't, uh, they don't have, uh, you know, that much ground support, but they do have Blue Flame. Infernal Pre-Igniter is gonna definitely make these units significantly better at picking off whatever. And right now, I mean, the Locusts are trying to get whatever value they can, but... This is not all too impressive. Once again, a couple of links managed to make their way into that mineral line here. They're trying to see whatever damage they can, and while a couple of the SCVs did, get end, up, uh, did end up getting bruised there, I really feel like Gumiho is in a very solid position. Now, supply-wise, Zerk is actually still ahead. A lot of that supply, though, is caught up in three supply um, swarm hosts. That is 48 supply right there for just a handful of swarm hosts. Not usually something you really want to have at this point in the game. So supply counts can be a little bit deceiving, in particular with those roaches added to this as well. But I think that Gumiho has got enough. Still, Gumiho has to be careful. He can easily overextend, right? One solid group of locusts and this game is over. There's also a lot of Bane links and they can also connect with these Hellions. And if they manage to, this game is over, right? All of a sudden, if these Hellions are out of the equation, that means that the rest of these units are going to be able to pick up whatever they can. Immediately, though, once again, those stores are going to be picked up into the Metavex. Looks like they are headed towards that main base. And while the fourth hatchery was in a little bit of trouble, beautiful micro here actually so far by our Terran player, trying to see if he can keep several of these units alive at once. And it looks like, yes, he will do exactly that. At the same time, the Vikings are trying to see if they can pick off a couple of those overlords. Once again, though, a big chunk of this Terran army is now caught out in the middle of the map. Solid move there by Solar. Does get the Locust on top of a bunch of those stores as well as those siege tanks. So all of a sudden, right, that army disappears. A few of the Hellions trying to see if they can uh, make their way to watch the mineral line once again. More and more drones end up falling, but actually, that was a fight where I expected Gumio to roll over his opponent, but Solar managed to hold on. Fourth base is alive. He managed to clean up a lot of those important units here for the Terran mech player as well. And while the Swarm host, I mean, they are going to be needing, like, they need replacing here at some point, right? Once the Terran player uh, reaches a maxed out state, I always feel like they are not going to be as valuable anymore. But Gumiho used them very effectively there to just simply clean up a lot of those armies. Very solidly done. Plus, on top of that, the hatchery in the main base still lives, and while 46 drones ended up going down, Solar still has 59 workers, which is really all you need at this point in the game. Another base is now secured here as well by the Terran player, though. He does have that command center on the low ground. Planetary Fortress, of course, very, very potent here. Once again, continued Medivac harass. I love this. The Thor drops are really getting out of hand. They have been doing a lot. Right? They are just simply, like, picking up a couple of things here and there. And if you have Metavex, you have Thors, there's no reason not to do this, right? Other than the fact that it requires a lot of multitasking. It's a very nice little move that provides so much value if you consistently keep it up during the entirety of the game. Gumihodo, once again, dropping a couple of those blue flame hellbats as well. Locusts are trying to see whatever the value they can. They will be able to, at the very least, pick up one of those Thors, it looks like, as well. Right now, though, a couple of those... Oh my god, the Siege Tank's actually dealing a massive amount of splash damage. A couple of the Locusts managed to close the distance, and once again, a Thor ends up going down. I really have to say, Gumiho is making the most out of... Or rather, Solar is making the most out of his army. Still, though, at this point, look at this Terran force. This is not an army to be messed with. The Banelings will end up going down very easily. Not a whole lot of Hellbats remain, though. That does mean as soon as these Hellbats, um, you know, disappear, that the Locusts can deal a huge amount of damage as well. Still, a lot of them are continuously coming out. That's five Hellions at any given moment here for a little while already. The fourth base eventually does end up dying here as well. And while the Locust Wave comes in, I feel like they will be roasted very easily. Great pickup micro actually there by Gumiho as well. Uh, just simply keeping that weakened Thor alive. And this is actually one of the reasons, right, why people stopped playing Swarmhost. It's this 
great pickup micro that the top of the line Terrans have been showcasing on those Metavex. It was very uncommon for players to make Metavex with a Thor based composition until Gumiho started doing it in recent times. And I think he's trying to see if he can obtain the victory right here, right now. He's getting a huge amount of value out of those units. Now, once again, right, the Swarmos are trying to see if they can potentially set up a bit of a, a flyby, I suppose, with the Locust on top of all of those tanks. Hellbat's currently not in a great position. Once again, though, lifting up that Thor to deal a lot of damage. The Banelings are desperately trying to connect here as well, but most of the Hellbats do stay alive, and I think that Gumiho took a very solid advantage there. Gumio will be the victor of this series as Solar is forced to GG out. What a solid match. Really nicely done. Well-deserved victory there by Gumiho. I can't help but wonder what would have happened if Gumiho didn't get like, I don't know, 18 drone kills or so really early on into this match, right? Remember when he got, uh, got all of those Hellions into the mineral line? I really wonder what would have happened if those were deflected. But regardless, a victory is a victory. A win is a win. And I hope that you enjoyed watching this match. If you did, make sure you hit that like button down below. And if you want to see more, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you get a notification as soon as I upload more. Other than that, I want to thank you for watching. Have an amazing day. Do not forget to smile, alright? And I will see you in the next one.